Peter, um, for inviting me. It's a very pleasant uh, experience um, in Paris. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, poverty and marginalization in urban China. And uh, along with uh, rapid urban growth and economic development in China, uh, there have been some social problems. And the government publicly admit that there's a private problem. And therefore, uh, the government is very keen to understand how many poor. So it's become a practical research topic, i.e. to identify how many poor by benchmarking, by measuring. So currently, poverty research inside China is a hot topic, but very much in a policy and a, a research paradigm, i.e. to measure to benchmark poverty. So what I'm going to do here is to reflect on our experience uh, of research projects in China uh, on uh, about urban poverty in particular, try to understand the source of urban poverty, the source of social exclusion, and try to understand the role of the state and how urban poverty has been produced. So we will focus on the production of marginalization. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that there has been a new underclass, or probably it's not the proper word, underclass, but a deprived class comprising laid off workers uh, who were state owned enterprise employees uh, but were laid off uh, during the economic reform, uh, as well as uh, rural migrants uh, in urban China. And in Shanghai alone, the recent census, 2010, indicate that about 8 million migrants. So that's roughly population of London. And the, in terms of research on urban poverty, there have been different frameworks to understand urban poverty. One notion is about transition or transitional economy. Uh, I think the term of transitional economy is a, a terrible terminology, i.e. It, it, it derived from the study of Eastern and Central European economies, uh, implying that there are state switch, i.e. you switch from centrally planned economy to a market system. But in reality, at least in China, the two systems very often co coexist. Uh, and uh, we have seen uh, a double transformation during the period of economic reform, i.e transformation of the welfare system. The, the retrenchment to some extent, but also the development of the minimum income guarantee system. Uh, on the other hand, we are seeing the lab labor market change, uh, the abandonment of the permanent uh, lifelong employment. And because of this kind of a change, and, and some social groups never made this kind of transition. They really sub, uh, they uh, <coughs> laid off uh, by industrial restructuring, but they are never uh, they they are never able to return to the mainstream uh, employment. Uh, probably uh, this kind of employment uh, is funded uh, by foreign investors uh, in the export oriented uh, industries. <coughs> And rural migrants took over many of these kind of like hard and uh, low pay uh, jobs. And so, it, the purpose of my research is to, as I said, to uh, explain the social exclusion issue. And in order to understand social exclusion issues, we really need to look at the specific configuration, as Eutar mentioned, this particular configuration. I think I would like to emphasize the Chinese context, its history. And very often it's difficult to apply uh, concepts developed in the Western economy to China. For example, citizenship. Citizenship is kind of a new concept in China. Because if we look at the socialist period, there was no kind of a universal uh, 
nationwide citizenship practice. Social welfare was distributed or embedded in all inclusive uh, workplaces. So it is not the national state or the city government who distributed the welfare, but rather your employ employer as the state owned enterprises. So employee and employer in that sense uh, go beyond the economic relation, but it's a kind of social relation, uh, quite tight. And also, uh, if you look at the labor forces, there's a huge division between urban and rural. Rural population was entirely outside the state system. Uh, there's a fundamental division between urban and rural, or urban and rural dualism. And there's a practical reason for doing that, for separating urban and rural, because the state wanted to speed up industrialization. And by compulsory purchasing rural agricultural products, it subsidized it, the, the living cost of the workers inside the city, and therefore you can produce goods cheaply in that sense. And, and within the, so to, because of this kind of a urban and rural dualism, you have notion of this inside and outside of the system so during that period of time. And also, I think it probably not uh, entirely proper to characterize Chinese system, so society as a kind of a, uh, or the Chinese state as a, a dictatorship, a dictator, uh, authoritarian state. I think uh, another word probably is more proper is uh, totalitarian. A totalitarian means that, as I mentioned earlier, is a, a, close, a, a tight and close relationship between employee and employer. And therefore, you by uh, asking the state-owned enterprises to distribute the welfare, uh, you created a, so, as sociologists said, organization of dependency. So you thought kind of a <coughs> close relationship between employer and employee. So in the pre-reform period, uh, in terms of social configuration, uh, you will see at the core <coughs> of the labor force was state-owned enterprises, employees, who enjoyed uh, housing allocation, uh, occupational safety, insurance, uh, uh, social relief, etc., etc. Uh, all these benefits were tied up with the employer. And in, in the rest of the city, you also see urban population who has urban residents registration status, but without a formal employee. People who worked as a self-employee, a uh, very limited amount, are also people who worked in state collectively owned enterprises. So it's not state owned enterprises. And beyond that, you will see a vast <coughs> majority of rural uh, population who have no, have no urban uh, hook up or urban registration <coughs> status. So what I'm trying to say, indicate is that before <coughs> economic reform, before market, market oriented change, there was already a very complicated division uh, between the, uh, within among population. And market reform uh, has started uh, several uh, changes, late, mar late market changes, the change from a permanent kind of a, a relation to a contract, work, work contract, or temporary workers. And uh, in terms of housing provision, the state promoted a uh, commodifying housing, uh, state stop, suspended a housing allocation to state owned enterprises. And uh, urban households have to buy housing developed commercially in the property market. And in terms of education, uh, it virtually it changed to a fee base. So although the state, the central government asked, uh, required uh, nine years of compulsory education, but a lot of, uh, a high percentage was contributed by the local government and local state. And in a minute I'll talk about why the local state is reluctant in 
investing in social expenditure. Um, and, and, and in reality, that schools ask for uh, voluntary donation. And you have to pay something in order to get into school. And in many cases, you have school catchment area. And if you are living outside school catchment area, you could uh, get into school by paying donations. If, and also uh, in terms of uh, 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 school entrance examinations, if a, ch uh, a child falls below a certain amount, then you could convert the gap into capital contribution. <laughs> so it's literally uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> changed into a, a kind of fee-based uh, private education. And healthcare is another major change. It, inquire, it requires a certain amount of individual contribution. And hospitals uh, are no longer subsidized, uh, but by getting uh, the money from selling medicines. So that's why doctors tried very hard to over-prescribe your thing. If you got a cold, they prescribe heavy medicines, expensive, important medicines. As long as you can afford it, because they got money from get money from selling medicines. Uh, so in literally all aspects you can see a significant change. And I think in terms of political economy, a major change is economic evolution, i.e. Uh, the rescaling of the decision making to the local state. And uh, giving the local state the, uh, great autonomy to retain the profit from self-funded projects. Uh, and all these self-funded projects are outside the state budgetary control. And the state, the local state could uh, therefore accumulate capital and to invest in new infrastructure projects and to attract investors. So what we are seeing is uh, a development of so-called entrepreneurial state uh, who is very keen uh, to attract investment. On the other hand, uh, relate to that uh, mission is the promotion of home ownership or housing ownership. And that, that, that's, uh, that explains why the local state is reluctant uh, to invest in affordable housing because to them it is a purely cost. But rather they would much like to uh, invest in uh, commodity housing or to, to develop uh, land to sell the land in the land market and then got money or land revenue from selling the land, uh, land. And because of the development of the home ownership, uh, property rights become a major dimension to divide uh, different uh, divide population and it became a base of participation for example, in the suburb of Chinese cities, you see a widespread of uh, gated communities. And in the past, uh, state uh, aid or state estate aid uh, departments manage uh, this uh, housing sector. But now, increasingly, homeowners association began to uh, take over to uh, to manage it. And also, you will see the exclusion of migrants, because migrants are not homeowners. They came to the city, they are tenants, and they live in a urban village. In a minute I'll explain what urban village is. And in villages, urban villages, for example, you have like a, a 3,000 lo 3, local farmers who are owners, but 80 uh, migrants who are tenants. Migrants had no uh, power at all to decide how the, the, the village should be developed because they are not on, on, they are not owner. Right is really based on the ownership, and the, the uh, local farmers developed a, a system called uh, shareholder companies. And because migrants are not do not own the share of the land or the property. Therefore, they are not uh, participating in any uh, this sense. So our last couple of years, we did uh, two uh, research projects on China. 
one particularly look at the working class neighborhoods, uh, look at the property right change, and how that uh, affect the issue of urban poverty. The second one is more specifically look at uh, migrant villages, or the, the villages developed uh, by uh, farmers to accommodate the, uh, migrants. And uh, I'll talk these two uh, cases. The first case is about the working uh, class uh, uh, community. Uh, this is a community uh, uh, in uh, the suburb of uh, Nanjing, and it is the industrial area. It was developed in the socialist period, and you can see that there's a railway branch leading to the factories, because it's a uh, heavy equipment production uh, area. And uh, the, the area was developed nicely uh, because the state invested it uh, in the area, and you can see that it is a mature uh, urban area and with this newspaper reading stands and the state provides everything including this, uh, newspapers as well. Uh, and, but increasingly, uh, this is a, a worker's dormitory, uh, increasingly wealthier uh, uh, workers, or, or not workers, wealthier company directors or the factory directors began to move out uh, the, the compound and while the uh, workers uh, stayed there. So uh, some of them were, uh, were <coughs> laid off uh, during the economic uh, reform period and uh, become, uh, originally the dormitory was allocated to uh, unmarried workers. But because of this stop allocation of uh, housing and more uh, the workers have to uh, live there and uh, develop uh, with their families later on. And if we think about the how the working class is uh, disfranchised, we can think in this case uh, I think the change of state workplaces is a major issue. The demise of state workplaces has led to the weakening of the occupational welfare, or suspension of occupational welfare. And therefore, you will see the transformation from all inclusive kind of state labor relations to a kind of minimum living standard form. A living, minimum, minimum living standard form allow you to physically survive, but at a very limited capacity to go beyond that. So I think the side effects of uh, minimum living standard form uh, is that it captured people, uh, vulnerable people at the margin of uh, poverty. Um, and, and in this case, we also see uh, the inequality has generated uh, and it shows a strong past dependencies. For example, uh, those who were allocated the bigger houses benefit most from commodification. When it was privatized, you got money, and then you sell it out, and you move out to a commodity housing, and when the property price inflates, and you also benefit from uh, the property price inflation. And the second case is about uh, migrant villages, or the urban villages. <coughs> During the rapid urban expansions, early uh, former rural villages uh, were encroached by urban expansion. And this is really the, the boundary of Guangzhou in the late 80s. Uh, the rest of the uh, area was uh, agricultural land. And now this place has transformed into the new CBD of Guangzhou. And when you look at the morphology, you will see a different kind of uh, type of uh, uh, properties. Uh, for example, uh, villas, and uh, this were high-rise commodity housing, and this is village. Village encroached by the central business financial center development. And in Guangzhou, the village 
retain uh, the village structure because of relatively stronger uh, the, the village structure based on the, the, the family, extended family. And this is a village in uh, Shenzhen, urban village. And rural farmers try to build uh, as much as possible on the designated plot. Uh, therefore, you can see that very narrow alleyways, and everyone tried to build right up to the edge. And all these uh, properties uh, are rented out to accommodate uh, migrants. And because when migrants move into the cities, it's difficult for them to find uh, uh, housing. Uh, they could not. They could not afford commercial, uh, private rental housing. They have to live in uh, these uh, kind of urban villages. And the government uh, described urban villages as uh, cancer and uh, the problematic area, uh, dangerous area, uh, because it, when a migrant moves into these uh, villages, it's difficult to trace it. It's very difficult from working class community. Because in working class community, a very strong kind of a state-owned enterprises structure, therefore everyone is identifiable. Uh, because migrants is, are relatively uh, mobile. And the government tried very hard to demolish all these uh, urban villages to build uh, new uh, commercial housing, commercial uh, commodity housing, as well as uh, the uh, office buildings. And this is uh, the uh, demolished urban villages in Guangzhou. At the background is uh, the office space for Guangzhou trade fairs, which is one of the major trade fairs in Guangzhou. Another case is in Beijing, uh, a village near the science park or IT park. And increasingly, many uh, new graduates uh, could not afford commercial commodity housing and have to rent a room uh, or even shared room in these places. And these new migrants, uh, new graduates, call them uh, IT migrants. And, and the, even there's a nickname, uh, they call themselves uh, as uh, Ant Tribe. Ant, Ant Tribe. And, uh, and it became a, a problematic uh, when a novel uh, was published uh, two years ago, described the miserable condition of uh, Ant Tribe. And although many uh, IT migrants told me that this is relatively convenient location near the IT street, and, and also you can find restaurants, and grocery stores, and everything there. It's relatively convenient and rented cheap. And when we visit the, the place, uh, it is under demolition. And uh, uh, we talked to one of the property owners, and uh, we uh, made an appointment and said, we'll talk to you next week. And we, when we phoned uh, him uh, in the following week, he said that there's something urgent. I couldn't talk to you. I thought that he might use it as excuse. I said, then when you went there anyway, and when we went there, it's disappeared. It's like this. That's no wonder that uh, he said there's something yeah. urgent mm -hmm. going on. And what is planned is to develop a uh, new town. Uh, have they learned from a, a British new town experience to develop 29 uh, high-rise buildings? This and, and also, you, you may wonder what the government, Beijing <coughs> municipal government, benefited from this. Because Beijing municipal government sold the land uh, at uh, 5.6 billion uh, yuan to a major developer to develop this new test. So, for the local uh, state, you will see that's kind of an entrepreneurial driver for them to create it. So, I, I will think. If in that case, in the case of rural migrants, <coughs> see they are disfranchised because they are treated as floating populations in a in similar way as uh, undocumented <coughs> immigrants in the States, but not because they don't have citizens of national citizens. They, have, they do have a Chinese PRC citizens, but their citizens was 
constrained locally by a local hospital registration status, which is excluded as, uh, in, from the entitlement. B, the local entrepreneurial state uh, who uh, is more keen uh, to develop uh, the land rather than to distribute social welfare. And therefore, migrants' uh, uh, right to the city is limited. Uh, they are not entitled to local welfare systems or uh, they are only entitled to a different system of a lower standard. And, in, and I think when we study marginalization, I think it is important, therefore, to understand a particular space and particular social group. So this <coughs> huge map is just try to map out particular social groups in particular neighborhoods. <coughs> For example, we will look at the unemployed urban households in old urban inner neighborhoods. Uh, we can understand why they are there. Probably because they were uh, collected. Uh, they worked as uh, <coughs> they worked in collectively owned enterprises, not state-owned enterprises. They were not entitled to stay allocated housing in the socialist period. And therefore they <laughs> did not benefit from housing privatization. And when uh, during the economic reform they were suffered first uh, from these processes and probably they were laid off first uh, in the in this process. So probably I should conclude now uh, to suggest that when we look at marginalization in China we need to understand that it is a process in which the right to the city uh, has been constrained. And, and the role of the state is very important in the production of the marginality because it uses various sorts of pre-configured structure, institutional setups, to constrain different rights of different uh, social groups. There's a strong past dependencies, as I said, institutional setup by state for example, household registrations. And also it's related to how the poverty is managed along these configurations. For example, exclusion of migrants from urban welfare. And therefore, just to repeat, and marginalization is not, uh, in this case, uh, peripheralization of laboring economic uh, system. For example, rural migrants about majority of rural migrants work in the migrant villages. Over 70% of migrants work in one way or another. So the employment rate is very high. So they are they engage in the global commodity production. So in that sense, they are not peripheralized, but they are marginalized because the they are managed by the state in a particular way. Uh, along the line of insiders and outsider systems. They were treated as outsider state system and under the market oriented reform they were this kind of outsider were continued excluded from additional benefits. Thank you very much. I'm impressed that you can cover such a vast area and provide a lot of new ones. Um, do people have questions? Well, anyway, that's fascinating. Just a, an empirical question. Can you just spell out for us how the, mecha the ongoing mechanisms of what I would call influx controls impact on the dynamics that you uh, literally, practically, how do they well, manifest? What kind of the, influx the right to be in the city, the right, to, the <coughs> presence in the city, the sort of the, the state policies of. of There's of no uh, physical control. Migrants can move into cities. Uh, and can you describe the transition to that process and when and why? What kind of discussion led to that shift? <coughs> I, I think in the past, um, <coughs> migrants were constrained by. 
the Costco registration system. And when they move into the city, it, it's basically it's impossible for them to move into the city. Um, and, uh, um, and there was a period that migrants were sending back uh, by the local police. Uh, if you become uh, unemployed or you can find a job. <coughs> But the state stopped doing that. So I think in terms of uh, mobility, there's no particular constraint. In, in terms of physical mobility, there, there's no particular constraint for migrants. So migrants do change jobs uh, from time to time. And also uh, from city to city. And, and uh, for example, in the Shanghai region, because uh, migrants' payment is higher, uh, in general, and therefore a lot of migrants moved from the Tarawa Delta to Shanghai to get a higher, a better pay. So I think that that there's no uh, in terms of policy, there's no control for the migrants' movement. For long, that was fascinating. I, I'm curious as to uh, uh, the reception that your work has received in China. Uh, I'm just curious as to if, if any of your work has been translated, first of all, and given the, you know, given the story that you present is one that shows the human consequences of the, the so-called Chinese economic miracle, I'm just curious as to how you as a scholar of cities in China have been received and how your arguments have been received when you are in China. That's interesting because we do publish uh, in a quantitative way yeah. <laughs> in China uh, of our research uh, publications, uh, I think I think people, uh, local officials, are very honest and frank in terms of uh, discussions, um, and and also I think uh, many uh, Chinese uh, researchers are very outspoken uh, inside China as well. Okay. And mm -hmm. uh, and and but when we present our case in China about China, uh, inside China. We present it in, in terms of the result of quantitative select. Right. So we could move a bit more. Um, and but we published paper in Hong Kong based mm -hmm. journal and uh, a bit more than that. Uh, we talked about the poverty protections and the social exclusion issue. Mm -hmm. 